Hello and welcome to the first video in my of Mice and Men revision series. We're going to start off with one of the most interesting characters, I think, Curly's wife. And we're going to ask ourselves, is she a villain or is she a victim or is she a bit of both? This is particularly relevant if you're studying for your IGCSE or GCSEs, um, but hopefully it'll be relevant whatever curriculum you are studying. So before we even start, I want you to ask yourself that question. Is she more of a villain or more of a victim? Maybe you believe she's very strongly one or the other, or it's a little bit in the middle. But I want you to think, how would you kind of put that in a pie chart? <laughs> and then how would you justify that to someone? What kind of quotes would you use? What evidence would you use? And I suggest you pause this video and take a couple of minutes to really question that before we get going. Right, so let's look at how she might be seen as the victim and how she's introduced. So we actually first kind of hear about Curly's wife before we even see her for ourselves as the reader. We hear about her third hand or second hand through Candy when he's talking to George and Lenny when they've arrived at the ranch. And he says to them, you seen that glove on his left hand? Yeah, I seen it. Well, that glove's full of Vaseline. Vaseline? What the hell for? Well, I tell you what, Curly says he's keeping that hand soft for his wife. So first of all, We've got Curly's wife in the text. She never gets a name. So already she's a possession. She's She belongs to Curly. But more than that, Curly is, you know, as we find out later in the text, not a nice guy. And he's going around talking about his wife in a kind of sexual nature to anyone he meets. So already she's kind of portrayed as this kind of sexual object. She's sexually objectified. And her husband's talking about her behind her back. So even before we meet her, there's a little bit of a kind of we hear about her before we see her. So she gets painted as a certain type of person. And in terms of being portrayed as the villain, again, Candy has his own opinion. So he tells George she's been married two weeks and she's got the eye. And he thinks that Curly's married a tart. Now, in terms of what does got the eye mean? So we, when we can kind of infer that what that means is she's kind of got this look that she gives the other men. So the implication is that she's trying to seduce the other men. She's looking at other men, aiming to seduce them. And tart is a derogatory term uh, used for women seen to be kind of sexually immoral. So she's introduced as being flirtatious and sexually immoral, but this is Candy's opinion. Is it fair? Because we don't actually know for ourselves, it, the text doesn't say that Curly's wife has the eye. Candy says it. So we have to kind of question, what's John Steinbeck really thinking? And that's the kind of question we need to have in mind throughout the kind of whole, uh, you know, thinking about uh, Curly's wife. What is John Steinbeck trying to say about the treatment of women in the 1930s? Because in that way, John Steinbeck was a social commentator. He had a lot to say about migrant workers, about racism. So we need to think as well, what's he thinking about sexism and what's he trying to kind of, what's his message about that in Of Mice and Men? Because if we think about the 1930s, tough, tough, tough time for women. They just had the 1920s. So post-World War I, the economy was booming. Culturally, uh, things were very rich and exciting. Music was kind of exploding with all these kind of uh, new musical ideas, new artistic ideas. Uh, fashion uh, had kind of taken a very new direction and we had these beautiful flapper dresses. Um, and so for women, women were starting to get a bit of freedom in the 1920s. It was a good time to be alive. And then bam, 1929, Wall Street crash. Economy is shrinking. Unemployment is higher than it's, you know, the highest it's been. It almost peaked at 25%. And loads of people don't have jobs. And, you know, poverty is you know lots of more people in poverty and yes a lot of people lost their jobs but disproportionately more women lost their jobs and so again women have started to get this kind of role where they could go out and and party and have a good time and now in the 1930s they were losing their independence and being pushed back in the home and if we think about Kirby's wife this is quite relevant because we know that she wanted to be in the movies and she wanted to kind of have this exciting Hollywood glamorous lifestyle. But instead that dream has been crushed and she's living on a ranch with no other women with a husband who she doesn't like. So perhaps what was John Steinbeck trying to say about women in general in the 1930s? Have a think about that. But then we meet her for ourselves 
and this is how John Steinbeck introduces her. Both men glanced up, for the rectangle of sunshine in the doorway was cut off. A girl was standing there looking in. She had full rouge lips and wide-spaced eyes heavily made up. Her fingernails were red. Her hair hung in little rolled clusters like sausages. She wore a cotton house dress and red mules, on the insteps of which were bouquets of red ostrich feathers. Lots of imagery in here we can comment on. So to start off with, as she kind of comes into the into the bunkhouse, the light is cut off. Literally, it says it was cut off. The rectangle of sunshine disappears. So we've got this light imagery going from light to darkness as she arrives, creating a sense of foreboding, potentially foreshadowing the kind of negative impact she's going to have on George and Lenny. And then we then we get introduced to her description. So red lips, red fingernails, uh, red shoes with little ostrich feathers. So if we think about the meaning and the symbolism behind the colour red, uh, it can kind of symbolise sexual desire or uh, you know, sexuality in general, but it can also symbolise danger and a warning. So again, when, when Curly's wife is introduced, we've got this kind of double kind of understanding when we've got all this, this red imagery. However, on the flip side, John Steinbeck calls her a girl. So we've got this idea of innocence, of, of being young and inexperienced. This isn't some older woman who's you know, got this like big life of uh, you know, schemes. This is a girl. So perhaps it might be worth kind of thinking a bit more about that and what John Steinbeck was saying by calling her a girl. Now, very much she's introduced as this kind of flirtatious, seducing character. But we have to really question... Does taking care of her appearance mean seduction? Just because she puts lipstick on and puts some nail varnish on and wears nice shoes with, with feathers on, does that mean she's trying to seduce all the men? Or does she just enjoy that? And it's quite sexist to assume, uh, as the men do in uh, in the bunkhouse, the men on the ranch, it's, it's a sexist thing to assume that she does that to attract men. She could do that because she likes doing that for herself. So let's kind of... Uh, yeah, take what the men are saying and, and kind of critically question it as we go through the text. However, we then have this kind of flirtatious body language from her. She put her hands behind her back and leaned against the doorframe so her body was thrown forward. So again, we've got this idea that she's showing off her body. But again, maybe she is being flirtatious. Does this mean she's super evil? Does she deserve all the insults that get thrown at her? Like tramp tart, jailbait, rat trap, horrible, horrible words that kind of get used as descriptors for Curly's wife throughout the text. And a lot of them, if we look at jailbait, so the idea is, you know, she's literally someone who will be bait to lure you to jail. So the idea she'll get you in trouble. Rat trap, the idea that she's a trap. So we've got language of entrapment here. But again, is that fair? Do men have no self-control? Um, so if they get in trouble because they do something with Kelly's wife, that's her fault. Are, they, are these men incapable of, you know, uh, <laughs> saying no? So again, we've got this kind of sexist assumption here that she's there to get them in trouble. And the other thing is, OK, maybe she is throwing her body forwards. Maybe she is using her body to, you know, she knows that she has an effect on the men. Maybe she's bored. Is it a punishment proportionate to the crime? Calling her all these words, you know, tramp, tart, jailbait, rat trap. Is, is that proportionate to, you know, her just being a little bit, well, being flirtatious with the men? We then have this kind of juxtaposition as well, because Curly's wife, okay, she might look, she might look at the men a certain way. She might put her body forward, but there's no language that kind of, she, she doesn't uh, explicitly flirt with the men, but yet Slim comes through. And his voice came through the door. Hi, good looking. I'm trying to find Curly Slim. Well, you ain't trying very hard. I seen him going in your house. She was suddenly apprehensive. Bye, boy, she called into the bunkhouse and she hurried away. So Slim is flirting with Curly's wife. But is anyone calling him a rat trap? Or jailbait? Or a lulu? <laughs> All the words that Curly's wife's being called. So again, we've got this double standard. The men, it's okay for Slim to flirt with Curly's wife, but it's certainly not okay for her to flirt with him. 
And also, if we look at this, as soon as she finds out that Curly's gone into the house, she's suddenly apprehensive and she hurries away. So we can infer that Curly perhaps doesn't treat her very well or expects her to be in the house the whole time. And you can imagine being, you know, a, a youngish woman, uh, maybe late teens, early 20s, being stuck in the house all day. Uh, not the most fun. And yet this is how Curly expects her to act. He expects her to be this kind of good housewife stuck in the house. So another question we need to ask is, is she flirtatious or is she lonely or both? And Whit says this, he says, every time the guys is around, she shows up. She's looking for Curly or she thought she left something laying around and she's looking for it. Seems like she can't keep away from guys. But again, is she? Is it because she can't keep away because she's trying to seduce the guys or is it just that she's desperately lonely? It's not like she's got other women to go have a chat with. All she's got is the guys. So it seems like she can't do anything right except sit in the house all day talking to no one. And we have another double standard here. Because as soon as Wit says, says this, the men start talking about going to Old Susie's. Uh, and Old Susie's is, um, we can infer, it's a brothel. And Wit says, well, a guy got to have fun sometime. So the question there is, what could John Steinbeck have been saying about the double standards for men and women in society? So Curdy's wife is expected to be at home by herself all day, talking to no one. And equally, it's perfectly acceptable for the men, including Curly, to go off to a brothel. So not fun. Maybe definitely a victim, I think, in that uh, situation for Curly's wife. And then we have um, these quotes that she says to Lenny at the very end in the final chapter. Well, I ain't giving you no trouble. Think I don't like to talk to somebody every once in a while? Think I like to stick in that house all the time? I get lonely, she said. You can talk to people, but I can't talk to nobody but Curly, else he gets mad. How do you like not to talk to anybody? So here John Steinbeck really kind of, uh, I think, emphasises um, how lonely she has been as a character. And he kind of makes us look back at the rest of the, the text so far and question, actually, was she being flirtatious or did she just want to talk to anybody? So when you're writing about Curly's wife, that might be a question that you really kind of, you know, make your point one way or the other. Which one is it? Is she a massive flirt or is she a desperately lonely character? Another kind of question we can think of about is, is she powerless or powerful? And we have this horrible, horrible moment um, in the chapter, chapter three uh, in the barn with Crooks, where she really, you know, is a villain in this moment. So Crook stood up from his bunk and faced her. I had enough, he said coldly. You got no rights coming in a coloured man's room. I'm going to ask the boss not to ever let you come in the barn no more. And then Curly's wife says this line, which is just horrible. Well, you keep your place then. I could get you strung up on a tree so easy, it ain't funny. So Crooks, a black man, stands up to Curly's wife. And immediately she uses her power. She realises she does have power. And she kind of um, weaponizes that against Crooks immediately. And she weaponizes her white womanhood here. Because, OK, as a white woman, she might not have a lot of power in society, but she does have power um, against uh, a black man. So if we think about kind of the hierarchy of power, you'd have um, maybe white men at the top, followed by white women. And then black men and black women would probably be the kind of hierarchy, the order in, in society at the time. But Curly's wife uses the fact that she's a white woman. She knows that if she threatened or if she said that um, Crooks had done something to her, people would believe her over Crooks. And therefore, um, she might be powerless most of the time, but she knows she has more power than Crooks. And if you go back to that chapter, you see the effect it has from Crooks. It's, it's, it's devastating. He shuts himself off. He, he realises it kind of enforces how lonely he is and how little power he has. So... Certainly at times, Curly's wife is a victim, but in this moment, I think, you know, definitely a, a horrible, evil, mean, nasty streak in her that she uses against crooks. We've got to talk about dreams. It's advice of men. What is uh, Curly's wife's dream? She has an impossible dream. So she says to uh, Lenny at the end, another time I met a guy and he was in the pictures, went out to the Riverside Dance Palace with him, he says he was going to put me in the movies, says I was a natural. As soon as he got back to Hollywood, he was going to write to me about it. I never got that letter. I always thought my old lady stole it. 
She never got the letter. Difficult one. So she believes her mum stole it and she actually says, uh, you know, that's why she married Curly. So that's kind of how she ended up in this situation. But again, was this just a guy chatting her up, you know, uh, saying he was going to put her in the movies and kind of using that? Did he actually send the letter? We'll never know. But again, um, if we think back to kind of the 1920s, the Roaring Twenties, how exciting a time it was for, for women to kind of get that little bit more freedom. Uh, this is, you know, culturally, things were kind of exploding a little bit in a, in a great way. Instead, Curly's wife ends up back, well, ends up on a ranch, no one else to talk to, bored out of her brain. So what's Steinbeck saying about the kind of plight of women in the 1930s? Interesting question. The victim. Obviously, Curdie's wife is killed. So in that way, yes, of course she's a victim. But after she dies, how is she portrayed? John Steinbeck writes, She was very pretty and simple, and her face was sweet and young. Now her rouged cheeks and her reddened lips made her seem alive and sleeping very lightly. So after she dies, actually, all the kind of flirtatious connotations disappear. She's just... She's simple, she's young, she's a young girl who's been killed and whatever she's done in her life, she's not. it's not proportionate to the fact that she's been killed by Lenny. So have a think about what do you think John Steinbeck was perhaps saying about Curly's wife here. So that's a whistle-stop tour through Curly's wife. Um, there's lots more that we could say about her, so I'd really like to hear from you. Please put in the comments, is she a victim, is she a villain? What else do you have to say about her? Um, and also let me know as well in the comments, uh, what other videos would you like me to prioritise next? Okay, if there's any that you would like me to do, I will do them sooner rather than later. Um, but yeah, any other questions you've got about Curly's wife, pop them in below. And otherwise, I will post a video next week.